Today, in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. My, what a beautiful day. God's given us an auspicious day in which we can meet in the house of God and worship. And it's good to see you here. And you that's listening out in the radio listen audience, we appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping today we can be a real inspiration to you. So we welcome you this visiting here in the auditorium. And we welcome you this tuned in out in the radio listen audience. I know we have a lot of people sick and a lot of people with colds. Now if you take your medicine according to direction, if you have a cold, you should get rid of that cold in two weeks. If you don't take any medicine, you should get rid of it in 14 days. So you make your choice, and I hope you soon be straightened out and get rid of that cold and be back in the house of God and everybody be feeling better. So we appreciate your presence. You out in the radio listening audience, if you call somebody on the phone, have them to tune in and get this hour. We'll try to be a blessing to them. So if you have your Bible today, I want you to turn to the book of Job chapter 1. It's found on page 569 in my Bible, the book of Job chapter 1. Last Sunday, I brought a message on this thought, be not like the mule. I have a little booklet written by pastor up in Asheville, North Carolina, Ralph Sexton. And I have a few copies of this book and got a picture of a mule on the front of it. And I'm going to send this book out to those that write in and enclose a gift to be used to pay for radio time and expense and request the book. It's quite an amusing book. It tells you about some church mules and why they act like a mule sometimes. And I only have a limited number, so you in the radio listen audience, if you'd like to have one of these books on church mules while you ride in a church donkeys and enclose a gift, we'll... Send the book at your request. It's pragmatic. It's amusing. It's real amusing. And I hope that some of you are right. My mail has been greatly off this past week. I don't receive, think I received a letter since Monday or Tuesday in regard to support to our broadcast. Maybe one, maybe one yesterday, I believe, with a couple of dollars in it. I want you to pray for me and pray for this ministry that the Lord will take care of every need. And you out in the radio listen audience and listen daily and listen on Sunday. Maybe you never really give it a thought about the expense of the broadcast week after week. We work this together in getting out the gospel. I want you to pray about it. I want you to ask yourself this question. How long has it been since I've stood by Brother Edwards financially or have I ever done it? Or how would I feel if the broadcast wasn't on the air next week? We're now in our 35th year. The devil would like to sit off the air, but we want to stay on till Jesus comes and God gets through with us. And I want you to pray for him and write to me next week. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, is the zip code number. I'd like to hear from you next week. And if you're not getting the daily broadcast, if you will tune to this station where you're now listening, you can get it at 12 o'clock noon each day. So you be sure and do that. I'm giving you time to turn to the book of Job. I'm going to bring a message on why the devil attacked this man. There's a reason for it. I'm going to give you several reasons why he attacked Job. I was reading in the paper last week about how the Atlanta is a second from the top or the bottom or whatever you want to call it on the poverty level. It's the poor, second poorest city in the nation to its size. I was a little bit surprised. To read that, there's one up north, a little poorer than Atlanta. And then I read how so many people are below poverty level. And then I also saw in the paper where they're going to pay the ex-governor almost $58,000 a year pension. That's just a pension. Almost $58,000 a year. Now there's something wrong whenever you have a system like that. A man that's been the governor of the second poorest city in the nation. And then he retires at almost $58,000 a year. And that's paid for by the taxpayer's money. And there's something wrong with our system. There's something wrong with those politicians who will set up a situation like that. 
And if I were a compromising governor, I never would. Uh, I'd be ashamed to take uh, that amount of money from poor taxpayers that can hardly pay their bills and hardly pay their taxes and live and take almost $58,000 a year of their money as a pension. That's not counting the money he'll make in his law office and various other places and for speaking engagements and so forth. There's something wrong with our system today, something bad wrong, when Supreme Court judges can retire making more money in retirement than they can by being on the bench. There's something wrong. When politicians get elected and go in and feather on nests to that extent, there's something wrong, something bad wrong. Whenever the liquor crowd and the politician will tell you if they'll, if you'll vote for liquor stores, so then build liquor stores and open up uh, liquor stores and saloons and so forth, that they will reduce your taxes on your homes and and that money be used to help pay for education and things like that, and then every year you taxes on your homes go up and they're talking daily about selling bonds and raising money to pay to build uh, schools to help our schools and so forth and other things where they need it and I'm not against doing things for our schools don't misunderstand me but what happened to all of that tax money the liquor crowd supposed to make to reduce the taxes you go ask the officials you know what they tell you they'll kind of grin like a horse eating bries and say well Hadn't it been, if it were not for the liquor stores, you'd be paying more than what you're paying now. See, that's the way that gang of jaybirds get around you. They won't reduce your taxes, but they'll grin at you like a possum and say, well, now if we didn't have the liquor stores and didn't have the saloons and, and the mixed drinks, now your taxes would be much higher than what it is. Fully on that crowd. Beloved, they're a lot of you and get your vote and get you to do things like that and turn right around and laugh in your face. Now there's something wrong somewhere. I think we need to be very prayerful, very careful from here on in about who you vote for, and who you put in office, because many of them will lie to you and get in and they'll promise to do certain things and when they get there they won't do it. And it's hard to know who to vote for. I'll tell you, you just have to be much in prayer as a Christian and look to God and ask God to lead you and help you in this respect. And so you need to keep these things in mind. You know it's the truth. There's something wrong. We know there's something bad wrong in our judicial system. It costs some uh, five million dollars to try a man out in California that killed about 28 people. They tried him and sentenced him and then turned around and tried him again. It took 13 months to try that man twice. It costs five million dollars to do it. It costs the people in this town an average of $400 an individual to try that one cold-blooded murder. Something is sickening, something is bad wrong. When the man was guilty, they'd been far better off, took him out behind the barn and shot him and saved all that time and saved all that money and quit, quit acting a fool and spending people's money like that and dragging out these criminal cases 12, 13, 14 months, spending uh, millions of dollars for nothing. There's something bad wrong. Now, people need to do some thinking and wake up and see what's happening and what's taking place. It's foolish, it's silly to drag these trials out and then retry and retry and drag them out and spend money when you know people's guilty and play around and try to get them off and set them free. You know something's wrong. Now, that's not my message. I'm the messenger. And I'm going to give you the message from the Word of God, but I'm also responsible as God's minister to inform my people to help you and to keep you enlightened in respect to these things because this worldly crowd and a lot of people today that's, that's not acting fair and not, not to shooting straight and they need to be exposed and the men of God ought to expose them and I'm going to do my part of it whether people like it or not. Now in the book of Job chapter 1 I begin reading with verse 1. I hope you have your Bible open. At chapter 1 of Job, page 569. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And this man was perfect and upright and one that feareth God and sheweth evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also were seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels. 
500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to come and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of, of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, and there, thus did Job continually. Now that was a day when the son of Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and sheareth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? Has not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Now that's as far as I'm reading. And the devil asked a question here about the man Job. And I want us to find out why Satan considered Job. Now there's a reason for it. The book of Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible. Job was a great man of God. And the devil considered him. Now uh, the devil will consider you as well. You know there's a personal devil. You know that. There's no doubt about that. And the devil will take you in consideration. I'm going to tell you why he took Job in deep consideration. And then you will know why he would take you in consideration if you walk down the same road. Number one, Job was the greatest man in the land. There was not a man of God living in the days of Job any greater than Job. He was number one in God's book. The Bible tells us so. He lived close to God. He feared God. He loved God. And Job was great. The Bible says in chapter 1, your verses 3 and 8, so that this man was the greatest in all the men of the east. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? A perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and sheareth evil. God himself said, Job is the greatest. God looked down upon the earth among all men. And there was not a man on the earth that loved God and feared God and honored God and believed in God like Job. Now when you set out by the grace and help of Almighty God to be great in serving the Lord, you might as well look out the devil is going to be on your trail. And you should set a goal to be great for God. You should have a desire to do things for God and serve God and be a great person on the earth in serving the Lord. Not necessarily great in your own eyes or eyes of others necessarily, but great in the eyes of God. That God can call you a great person upon the earth. You can be that great person. Each individual that's listening to me right now can be great in the eyes of God on this earth if you really want to be great. We have far more people, they want to be great in the eyes of the world and be popular than they want to be great in the eyes of God. We have people today, they want to be well squared away and fixed in this life and never think about eternity and what God thinks about them. Now Job was great in the land. Number two, he was concerned about the welfare of his children. Now if you're the right kind of person, I don't care who you are, you should be concerned about the welfare of your children. And number one, spiritually. All parents should be concerned about the spiritual welfare of their children. The Bible says in Job chapter 1 verses 4 and 5, when Job's children pitched a birthday party, and the Bible said everyone went on his day, the boys seven of them, the girls three of them, and when they'd have a birthday, they'd have a birthday party. And Job knew there might be some things not exactly right going on at that party. And the old man would take a sacrifice and go to the altar. And there he'd get low before God. And he'd pray for those children. He would say, now Lord, my children's having a birthday party. And I 
I'm not sure that they're doing everything right. They may be doing some things that's not exactly right, Lord, and I want to come to you and talk to you about it and pray for them because I don't want them to be doing things that are not right. Wherever they go or whatever they, they're doing, and this was at a birthday party, of course. I wonder how many parents today, when your children are going off on a party, or they leave to go places, how many parents today are concerned enough to get on their knees and follow their children in prayer? I read of a woman one time. She had young people in her home, boys and girls. And when those boys and girls would go out on a date or a party, that mother would go to her knees. And she wouldn't get off of her knees until the last one came in. And then she'd get off her knees and go to bed. She was like Job of old. But today you have parents, they don't care where the youngins go or what they do or when they come in or how long they stay gone. A lot of times today the youngins have to get in and sit in the car until mom and dad gets in to open the door to let them in the house. Everybody going in every direction and all of them doing the same thing. It's pathetic. And so Job here was concerned about his children. And he said just in case there's something going on at that party that's not scriptural or not spiritual. I want to be much in prayer about it. Now God wants us to be concerned about the welfare of our children. And if we're not concerned about the welfare of our children, we, there's something wrong with us somewhere. We need to be deeply concerned about that. While they're small, you're able to have them around your feet and around your knees and bring them to the house of God. Tell them what to do and what not to do when they get up grown and get out on their own. About the only thing you can do is pray and ask God to help and that you need to do as an individual. We need to be concerned about our children. Number three, the reason the devil didn't like Job and considered Job not only because he was a great man, not only because he was concerned about his household, and believe me, every head of the house, every man, that's his responsibility, that he ought to be concerned about the spiritual welfare of his home and if he's not, then he's letting his family down. And we do thank God for good women that will take up the slack and try to do what she can when the husband won't do in that respect. But Job was a man, a 100% man, and he knew he had that responsibility, and so does every dad. He has that responsibility to see after the welfare of his children, spiritually first of all, and take care of their needs. And then reason number three is he had been blessed to the Lord. Now just as certain as God Almighty blesses you, the devil won't like it. The devil will take off after you because he knows if God blesses you, you just might amount to something for God. You might get something done for God. You might prosper in this life to the extent that your financial help can go a long way in the work of God. Oh, beloved, the devil don't like it. He, he just don't like to see God's people prosper. But when God's people prosper financially, whenever they support God's work and do what they're supposed to do for God, and God begins to bless them, the devil doesn't like that at all. And God is concerned about it, and so Satan is also concerned about it. And God had blessed Job, he'd become wealthy. He is the wealthiest man in the land. God had blessed him, gave him seven fine sons, three daughters, and gave him uh, camels and asses and so forth, and he was a very wealthy man. God made him that way. There's nothing wrong in having a little wealth, if you get it honest. Give God his part and consider the poor. Now, Job was that kind of a man. If there was a family down the street in need over across the hill on the farm and Made the husband died, left the poor woman there with small children that had no food. This man Job would take off over there and carry him some food. He was concerned about the, the poor. The Bible said he made the widow's hearts rejoice. Many times when they had no shoes for their children, no clothes for their back, no food in the cupboard, old brother Job that had been blessed of God would take them some over there and help them out. He loved God. 
You have a lot of people today, why well, bless your heart, they're going to hoard up every dime they can get. They wouldn't help anybody. They're going to take it all for themselves. They care nothing about anybody else, but not Job. Job loved the Lord. He was concerned about those in need. And so God bless you. The devil didn't like that. The devil won't like it if you are concerned about taking care and helping others in need. Number four, this man Job served God because God because he loved the Lord. I wonder how much do you love God today? In Job chapter 1 and verse 9, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? You know what the devil said about Job? He said the same thing and sang the same song he's been singing for almost 6,000 years. And that song is this. All he's out for is the money. While the devil said that man Job said he's rich. And the only reason in the world he's serving God is because of what he can get out of it. It's because he you knows God is blessing him and has made him rich. And the devil saying that, he's been saying it ever since. He sings it today about uh, preachers and his youngins join in on the course and they go along with him. They say the only reason he's preaching is for money. And the devil changed the tune a little bit and get on another line and say, well, he begs for money too much and his youngins join in on the course and say, yes, that's right. And they sang it with Satan. See, the devil's youngins always join in on the course whatever Satan is saying in that respect, they join in. And every preacher that's trying to do anything for God, it takes money to do the job. And when he lets the people know they need to help finance and do their part, then God's people say, man, the devil's crowd buck against it. And the devil starts up the tune and his youngest, they join in on the chorus. And so this man Job here was rich and the devil said the only reason he's out there serving God is because God's made him rich. Take what he's got away from him and he'll backslide. God said, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. The devil said he will. Said you take what he's got away from him and he'll curse and curse you to your face and he'll backslide. And later on God gave the devil a chance to see who was right. The fifth reason that the devil really took off after Job is because he feared God and he hated evil. Now here was a man that had the fear of God in his heart. That's a cry of need among the average person today is the fear of God in their hearts. And he hated evil. In Job chapter 1 and verse 1, there was a man in the land of us. His name was Job. That man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and ensued evil. He loved the Lord. He feared God. He hated sin. He hated evil. He hated weakness. The Bible says in Job chapter 29 and verse 17, And I broke the jaws of the wicked and plucked the spoil out of his teeth. Now this man Job took off after that wicked crowd. He, he is against wicked politicians. He is against the wicked crowd, the gamblers, the drunks, and the rest of them. He took off after them with the word of God, the message of God. He said, I broke the jaws of the wicked and I plucked the spoil out of their teeth. He did that in witnessing against them. And every Christian should witness against sin and evil and ungodliness. And Job feared God and hated evil. That's the reason the devil took off after him. Now, whenever you fear God with a God that fear and you turn against evil, better look out, the devil's on your trail. He'll take off after you. Reason number six, the reason the devil took off after Job is because Job believed that God would do right. Now all human beings won't do right, but God will do right. In Job chapter 1, verses 20 through 22, Then Job arose and rent his mouth, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked should I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord's taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this did Job sin not, and I charged God foolishly. In chapter 13, verse 15 of Job, Though he slay me, yet I trusted him, said Job. Now Job was a wealthy man, and the devil said to God, said, you take what he's got away from him, take his money, take his camels, his donkeys, take everything he's got, and he'll start cursing, and he'll curse you in your face, and he'll backslide. 
And God said to the devil, he said, I don't believe it. The devil said he will. God said, all right, we'll find out. God said to the devil, I'm going to let you loose on Job. And you can touch everything he has, but you can't touch his soul. I'm going to hedge that phase in. You can't take his life. You can't touch his soul, but you can touch his property and everything he's got. And we'll find out whether or not Job would backslide and curse and turn against me. And the devil knew he'd be a winner, so he took off. He just knew that. He knew if Job lost what he had, then he'd quit and quit serving God. And just like the devil still singing today, take the preacher's money away from you, quit preaching. You know, that's an old song the devil been singing 6,000 6, years ago and his youngins joining on the course, of course. And then uh, we find that the devil took off after Job and he lost his cattle. He lost all of his property. And then a, a cyclone came and, and killed his children. You know he followed 10 youngins to the grave. It's awfully hard to follow one child to the cemetery, but this man followed 10 to the cemetery. Why, he lost all of his children, all of his wealth, and then the devil turned on his health, and he lost his health, and boils broke out all over his body, and he was in terrible shape. He lost his friends. He lost someone else I'll mention later. But anyway, he lost all of these things and, and became a pitiful sight. And somebody said, now, Mr. Job said, what do you think about it now, son? He said, God will do right. He said, whatever God does, he's going to do right. Job said, not only that, when I came into the world, I had nothing. I came here naked. I had nothing. And when I die, I can can't take nothing with me. Everything I've had and enjoyed, God gave it to me. And if God takes it away, blessed be the name of God, God will do right. And Job believed that God will do right. And the devil said, I don't like that kind of believing. I don't want him to think God will do right. And Job said, not only that, but if God decides to kill me, that's all right too. I'm going to serve him anyhow. The devil said, I don't like a man to talk like that. And so the devil was defeated. Job lost everything he had, and God said, all right, heist up your tune now about the preacher preaching for money. Let's hear you saying that again. Why well, he couldn't get, he didn't have a tune to it then. He was defeated. He was defeated, and he had to admit it. But there's something else happened, and this is major in the life of every man, and that is Job would not let his wife change his mind when he determined to serve God. Now you men that are men, let this sink down into your ears. The Bible says in Job chapter 2 verses 9 and 10, Then said his wife unto him, Does I still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest one of the foolish women speaketh. All this did not Job sin with his lips. Now Job's wife came to the breaking point. No doubt she stood by her husband as long as she could. But when he lost everything he had and all of his friends turned against him, laying there in dust and ashes and, and boils all over his body, couldn't rest and uh, pain racking his body, health gone, she came to him and she said, Job, I can't take it any longer. Why don't you just go ahead and backslide on God and start cursing and just let God kill you and get you out of your misery? You know what Job said to his wife? Are you listening? Job looked that woman in the face, said, give birth to ten young'uns, and said, now you listen to me. You talk to me like a foolish woman. He says, I'm not about to stop serving God. I'm not about to quit going to church. I I'm not about to give up. I'm going to serve God. He said, not only that, if God kills me, I'm still going to serve him. That you talk like a fool to me. While she said you ought to backslide on God. Quit serving God. Let him kill you. Get you out of your misery. While you're a fool Job. Job said you're the one that's a fool. I'll serve God as long as I live. Now we thank God for our good women. Good women that are helpmates. That work with their husbands and serving God. But that man is the head of his house. God is looking down the gun barrel at that man. God has got to aim on that man. 
God is pointing the gun at that man. God is saying, you're responsible for your house. I'm holding you responsible for your house. And that man should set his face like a flint and not let his wife, his children, his brothers, his sisters, or cousins, uncles, nieces, and nephews, in-laws and outlaws, and all the rest of that crowd, deviate him from serving God Almighty. If his wife, his young'uns, all of his kin folks turns against him because he's serving God, let them go. Go ahead and serve God. Old man Moses over on the backside of the desert started over to deliver his family, deliver the, the children of Israel out of Egypt. His wife went along and she kept murmuring and complaining about it and grumbling about the matter of circumcision and calling him a bloody husband. You know what he said? He said, you get your little suitcase and go back to your mom and daddy. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. And he sent her back home. He sent her back home. He said, I got a job to do for God. If you can't go along with me and help me serve God, you can go back to mom and daddy. I got a job to do and God wants me to do this job. I'm going to do this job. And he sent her back. And he went on into the land of Egypt and led his people out of the Egyptian bondage across the Red Sea. And after he got out of danger, went into the desert. And lo and behold, while he was leading his church along, he saw some people coming toward him. Guess who it was? It was his wife and youngins and his father-in-law. And Moses ran out and gave somebody a big kiss. Reckon who it was? It was his father-in-law. And there he went on and took his family and served God. But Job did not let his wife or his family stand between him and God and what he's supposed to do for the Lord. And every man should be a man and say, for me and my house like Joshua, well, we're going to serve God. And at any time, any man has got backbone enough to stand up and not let his family deviate him from the path he should trod and serve God Almighty. God will bless that man and the devil will hate that man and the devil will take off after that man. They try to destroy him any way he can. Beloved, men are responsible to serve God and say for men, my house, we'll serve the Lord. And a good wife that's worth the salt that goes in the bread would be willing to go along with a good saved husband and serve God. If not, there's something wrong with her. He needs to turn over to God and say, God, you take care of her, whatever it takes. We're going to serve God. Now we come to another thought. And that is the reason the devil hated Job is because he made the heart of the widows and the fatherless glad. In Job chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Behold, thou hast instructed many, thou hast strengthened the weak hands, thy words have upholden him that was fallen, thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. Now poor old Job would help the afflicted, he'd help the weak, he did what he could to help people. And then in Job chapter 29, verses 12 through 16, Because I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and them that had done to help him, and had none to help him, the best of him that was ready to perish came upon me, I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I was eyes to the blind. I was feet I was to the lame. I was a father to the poor. And the cause which I knew not, I searched out. Now this man Job was blessed financially. And he made it his business to help take care of the widows, the offerings, those in need. And problems he couldn't understand. He got down on his knees before God and he searched them out. And found the will of God. And he loved the word of God. No wonder the devil hated this man. Job chapter 23 and verse 12. Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I've esteemed the word of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job said, I love the word of God more than I love the food I eat. No wonder the devil hated this man. He loved God's word. And he followed God's light. Job 29 3. When his candle shined upon my head and when by his light I walked through the darkness. Job said, I stood up and followed the light of God and sat by the candlelight to find out more about God. And then he prayed for those that misused him and abused him. In Job chapter 42 and verse 10, he prayed for his enemies. He prayed for those that mistreated him. He prayed for those that did him wrong. Job was that kind of a man. That's why the devil hated him. Then finally, he believed in the resurrection and the coming of the Lord. Job chapter 19, verses 25 and 26, he said, I know my Redeemer liveth, that he shall stand as a latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body in my flesh, shall I see God. Here is a man 
that believed in the resurrection. Here is a man that believed in the coming of the Lord. No wonder the devil hated this man. When you take a stand like Job of old, the devil will despise and hate you. He's not your friend in the first place, and you need to do everything you can to give him a black eye. And when you trot down the road like Job did, you can do it. And the devil will hate the ground you walk on, but God will love you and bless you. And you'll be glad you did when you come to the end of life's journey. Let's stand. Dear Heavenly Father, as we preached about this man, Job, we thank you, God, for the written word about him and for his stand. God, we pray that you'll help thy people to stand like Job of old. We know the devil hates people that stand for what I mentioned today. And I pray, my God, that many will be challenged to stand today for that which is right. In Christ's name, amen.